Hello and welcome to another episode of L&D Disrupt. This time I'm joined by Assemble Use Adam Lacey to discuss their future human content series. This is a series of audio lessons focused on helping people develop the transferable skills they'll need to thrive in the next five years. We talked through five of the 10 skills here and you can check out the full series using the link in the description. And before we jump into that conversation, just a reminder that you can still sign up for How Now's What The Fluff Bootcamp completely free. Six modules for building a winning L&D strategy with proven frameworks and tactics. Just go to gethownow.com forward slash WTF hyphen bootcamp today. But that's it from me. So let's get into this conversation on future human skills with Assemble Use Adam Lacey. <laughs> The Future Human is a series of audio lessons focused on helping people develop the transferable skills they need to thrive over the next five years, maybe 10 years. Um, it's based on a competency framework that references the World Economic Forum's skills for the future, but it focuses in on the very human skills, if you like, that AI can't replicate. So that, that skills framework included technical skills as well. We, we took all those out. We looked at the very human skills um, and then we added to them based on some of our own conversations we were having with um, with with customers and, and things like that. Um, and by we, it's quite important, actually. So we developed the series in collaboration with um, Liggy Webb, who is a behavioral skills specialist. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's that's it in a nutshell. Nice. Yeah, I've seen some of the content. I've watched the, the webinar you did on it, and it is really interesting to hear that that backstory on how you built this out and where you got that inspiration. And I was just curious around when you're having those conversations with people, what you read in those reports, what were the key drivers of this? I have my assumptions, but I don't want to ask leading questions. So what were the, the key drivers of this need for the human skills and the, and the importance of building them? Yeah, when I mean, you can, you can probably, you can probably guess your, your assumptions probably right. So, you know, there's this thing called AI that's come along um, and, um, and, you know, large language models in particular. And, and that's the, that's the big driver. And I think it has so much potential to dramatically shift the way we work, to displace existing jobs, to disrupt entire industries and organizations. Um, that, you know, with that, with that kind of potential on the horizon and that threat almost, Liggy and I wanted to start a discussion, um, which incidentally led to creating a, a product together, which was great, but it started with a discussion um, that focuses on what we really believe will be the currency for the currency of the future, if you like. And, and that currency is our, our humanness. So the things that can't be replicated at the moment artificially, um, what makes us different, what makes us human. Um, and that set of skills as well, we were we were really, really keen that it was entirely transferable across industry, uh, job role and all that kind of stuff. And, th and that's where we really landed on just focusing on behavioral skills over some of the kind of technical skills. So, of course, we're going to need technical skills in the future. You know, I think that's the, that is an obvious one almost. Um, but what we wanted to do was really think hard about, OK, well, we're going to need the technical the technical skills. But actually, what what sits behind that and what's going to become even more important as we go into this this next in technical industrial revolution whatever you want to call it yeah that's something that really appealed to me about this because obviously well regular listeners will know that my background is marketing primarily copywriting and one of the things i'm finding is a lot of people want to future proof themselves and their skills and focusing on your human skills in terms of copywriting can actually ensure that you do future proof yourselves as people go closer to using tech to write copy because empathy for my audience or understanding my audience is very hard for AI to do or adding in real personality or really capturing what the brand tone of voice is becomes very difficult. So I know we're going to talk about something like empathy later and, and some other similar skills, but from a personal perspective, I really do see this as a good way to future proof yourself, which is I know one of the big fears for people um, is the, the rise of tech and or maybe how AI might make them more disposable or make their skills more redundant so um yeah I'm, I'm massively seeing that yeah exactly and so that that's that's what this series is, is trying to look at is what are those set of skills that we are that, that we're really going to need and actually these are skills that have been around for you know hundreds of years we're talking about curiosity and resilience and stuff mm. and that, that, that's, they've always been a part of us but i think 
in the kind of uh, in the you know the, the way that we as the way that we work changes, those skills are going to become more important than they've ever been in the past, and that's why we wanted to um, create create this kind of series and this conversation around them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's going to be things people are familiar with, but I've, I've been doing some analysis of some companies how they do marketing recently, and what I've realised is. The vast majority of companies, it is just about executing simple things well. And I think the same thing applies to skills. It's just about ensuring you're covering some of the fundamentals really well. And you will, therefore, be able to do a bunch of other things effectively. So um, I I completely agree. From the other side of the argument, also being self-reflective and thinking about were there any skills that we could leave behind? So one thing I've seen, especially from a marketing perspective, is perfectionism. Perfectionism might not be a few... uh, a skill that lends itself naturally to performing well in the future with the world changing really quickly. So maybe making some concessions around that is something I've seen personally as a skill to perhaps leave behind. But was there anything you saw in those reports about things that won't help the future human? Yeah, it's, yeah, that's a really good question. I (laughs) nearly said copywriting, but I'm not going to say that, Gary, don't worry. (laughs) Not a good job. (laughs) I think, I I still think regardless of, you know, I, I think AI is getting very good at copywriting, but like you say, I think that that human, that empathy, those those elements um, are, are, are still quite difficult to recreate artificially. So I think there's uh, yeah, there's, there's probably an element of uh, of us being needed in there. I'm I'm pretty optimistic about the future. Actually, I think there's like there's many things that businesses and um, we as individuals spend hours and hours on, or in the case of businesses, like millions of pounds on, um, that we won't need to do in the future because i think technology will 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 enable a lot of that stuff so things like repetitive tasks um you know manipulating data all that kind of stuff i feel like some of that will get a lot easier and those some of those um some some of those repetitive tasks and skills we're not going to need as much and for me that just opens the door and paves the way for us to unleash our our creativity and and innovation so but you're absolutely spot on if that you know as that happens and things develop faster and faster yeah is something like perfectionism going to be you know needed as much in the future but i i think with perfectionism there's always instances and examples and stuff where you know you need to you need to make sure you go the extra mile and everything is you know really good but i i also definitely believe in done is better than great a lot of the time in that you know if you can if you can get to you know 80 percent, is that extra 20 percent worth it in in all examples then there will be somewhere it is but a lot of the time you know you're probably yeah yeah you're, you're probably right you're, you're almost better moving a bit quicker than um yeah. than than getting it absolutely perfect yeah, as with everything, it's in the middle ground, the grey area, the real sweet spot for yeah. that stuff. So, um, yeah, I completely agree. Cool. So, like I said right at the start, we're going to discuss five of the ten skills. Um, people can check out the full series, and I'll pop the link in the description. And the other caveat is, like you said, these are going to apply to anyone in any industry, but we're maybe going to put a bit of an L and D lens or spin on it because that's the audience that we're speaking to today. And the first one I wanted to speak to you about actually really typifies both those things because it's resilience. Resilience is really important for everyone, but I think for L&D teams, they're often called upon to respond to big shifts in the external environment or big changes to things that are happening in their company. And it can mean that things that we've spent ages planning, if we've not done that, done is better than perfect mindset, can get parked or we might be asked to move away from something we've been quite invested in, which which can be hard to take a lot of the time. So I just want to know a bit more about resilience as a future skill and any tips on on building it yeah no great great question and you're you're 100 percent right i think learning and development professionals are caught in this almost um perfect storm a lot of the time of uh having to wear 10 or 20 different hats because they're you know they're marketers they're they're um they're data analytics experts they're learning experts you know all these different things and then like you say they're also very very um you know, it, it, it's quite very affected often by external factors in the business and things are, you know, are, are called upon to move quickly when, when stuff does shift or change, you know, the pandemic, what an example that is of how quickly learning and development had to react and change what in many businesses, what they were doing, you know, overnight. Um, 
so yeah no you're, you're spot on there and for me resilience um is the ability to recover and adapt from adversity tragedy trauma all that kind of stuff and i think humans are remarkable at this so you only need to turn the news on to see you know bad things happening and and um and, and people reacting in a in a in a remarkably resilient way i i've always i always felt it was personally a tricky one to prepare for um until i met until i met liggy actually she she definitely helped me on, on this but i think i think you, you I, I really believe you only get to develop resilience during those inflection points in your life so when things are going bad when those external factors come and knock you sideways um when you're up against it it's that set of decisions you make at those points in your life that make the difference so you know do you react emotionally um or reactively or do you take a step back take a more holistic view and um make a more informed and, and practice kind of decision and i think the one of my favorite quotes from the series is you know you you can't we can't control the things that happen to us but we can control what we what we do next so our next move and that that kind of epitomizes resilience it's um it's really easy for me to sit here and say it um in practice you know it's really hard to do and right. i've struggled with it in the past making those good decisions yeah. at those times um liggy actually in the series talks about well-being and self-care as a way to improve prove and i hadn't really thought about this it was mm. quite enlightening for me but i was like you yeah, know you're absolutely spot on because the better you feel physically emotionally the more balanced the better place you're in when something does come and you know sideswipe you or, or you know hit you around the head yeah. um you're going to be in a far better spot to to recover to handle it to make a better decision going forward as well so you know, well-being, self-care, looking after your mind, looking after your body, eating well, exercise, all the normal stuff that everybody knows about that, you know, we all, we all struggle to do enough of because yeah. of the, the demands of our jobs, etc. cetera. Um, and I, I think it actually, that one for me, my, my second, I guess, tip or one of the things that came out of the conversation we had was, was extending that to the, you know, the network of people that you have around you as well. So people that keep you centered and grounded and actually things and doing stuff that has you centered and grounded as well. So hobbies, sports, you know, all this kind of stuff contributes to that, that better um, mm. physical, mental well-being place that you need to be in to to react uh, to react accordingly. So, so yeah, I think one of the one of the big things I learned from Liggy, especially around resilience, and she's a real expert in this, is that whole just how closely well-being aligns to how you actually develop this particular skill. So yeah, yeah that, was, that was one of the big things for me. No, it's interesting hearing you say that because for me, I think dealing with change and becoming resilient to it is, it is about putting yourself in the right spot to deal with it. And personally, something I used to find really difficult is if feedback about something I was really invested in was bad, and it, and it required wholesale changes, then I would, if I reacted to it straight away, I would react very emotionally and actually wouldn't process it very well and it wouldn't help me become more resilient. So added in a buffer that, you know what, I'm not going to look at this again until tomorrow and then I can yeah. try and be more objective about the feedback and actually that objectivity makes me focus less on it as a wholly negative thing or really drill into the negatives and then I can say right now I'm more able to process it and therefore I can act accordingly and I think you're right about how quickly you can deal with change that also means you can react faster so if it just if you know if you know you need to bake in a day to maybe process it and then you know that you can act more objectively you're in a better position to then act quickly and cope with that disruption and build that resilience so personally speaking I think finding that adding in a buffer or recognizing with self-awareness what doesn't help me be resilient or respond to disruption is is a big thing for me yeah and just you know turn those failures into learnings like yeah. you say and um it's not you know don't don't see i mean i'm using the wrong word there don't see them as a failure you know see it as a as an opportunity to to learn so funnily enough we um just before we went live with the webinar you mentioned we and we we had close to 500 people registered for that so yeah. it's quite a big one we couldn't get we couldn't get um for some reason and we've, we've used zoom webinars loads of times before but we couldn't get it. something went wrong with it and we yeah. were we were like 10 minutes from going live and we we're like oh no what's going to happen here there was a there was like a minor a minor technical bump shall we say and um yeah and, and liggy turned around and said you know what that's 
you know, she's like, if we're being resilient here and we're yeah. turning this into a learning opportunity or a positive, she's like, if, if we hadn't been able to go live, we would have been able to email everybody yeah. um, and follow up with a really nice edited recording because we could have recorded it separately. And so, yeah, and she was kind of, it, it was great. She was kind of actively coaching me through the, the kind of developing <laughs> resilience in, in that moment. We went live and it was absolutely fine, but yeah. it was, um, yeah, it was, it was those kind of, it, it's that mindset of actually being able to flip something over and say okay so what you know in this horrible or negative kind of situation what is the positive what can we yeah. learn how can we grow what's the yeah. opportunity here yeah no absolutely and that is literally my worst nightmare if we yeah. if people know we do <laughs> probably like two events a month and like if there's no one in the right waiting room five minutes before i'm like oh no something's gone wrong with the tech or yeah. um yeah, if my camera isn't working or anything like that. But you, you just have to go live. We actually had one internally. Um, it was me and Lulu from our customer success team. We did a webinar. We were presenting this data and her camera wouldn't work at the start. And everyone was in the, the session. We just had to crack on with it. And luckily, someone in the back end fixed it. But, you know, like worst case scenario for 10 minutes, they couldn't see her, but they could hear her. And we were presenting with slides. So it's, that perspective yeah. was um, needed and, and it was the closest I've come to that that real moment of the tech not working and also in the moment that it, you know that that kind of problem is created to be much bigger in your mind when actually you know as an someone logging on not being able to see someone on a webinar it's, it's probably not yeah. that big a deal to them yeah. and if you step back like you were talking about take a moment take a day I'm a massive fan of if I get a important email or an, a different a difficult email I flag it and then I I, I sleep on it and I look at it the next day. I think that's a that's a really top tip as well. Just yeah, don't um, don't kind of go in straight away. Hundred percent. You also mentioned as well that being resilient and building the skill of resilience can have a carryover effect into being more open and curious. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I think it can. I think the, the the really cool thing about all ten of these behavioural skills that we looked at in Future Human is they are. They are all interlinked in in so many in so many different ways. So yeah, I think resilience um, and, and curiosity, and actually, I think cur yeah, curiosity is a way to is a way to help develop resilience because you are if you're curious about more things, you have you have a wider and a broader perspective, mm. um, and you're more likely to make a more informed, better decision, or you're more likely to go looking for more data more angles you know apply more critical thinking another one of the mm. <laughs> another yeah, one of yeah. the skills we talked about we talk about in the series um and uh, and that all contributes to that um to, to kind of being more resilient so yeah they they're, they're, they're weirdly they're kind of all inter yeah. interlinked in in so many different ways and that was one of the real joys of putting the series together is we got to we got to explore those different those different links as well because rarely did we record a session and we and didn't you know, I don't think we recorded a single session where we didn't reference a load of the other skills. Mm. That's just sort of how it, how it worked in the end. Yeah. That's the perfect segue because we're going to move on to one of these that is really linked and that is creativity, especially yes. as a tool for problem solving. So if we know that we're operating in a context that's often changing fast, we'll need to find new solutions to new problems because new problems keep uh, arising, especially, you know, for LND teams, you referenced some of the key disruptions over the last few years and the, the issue of skills over the next few, but, yeah, talk us to about that that idea of creativity as a future human skill and, and any tips and advice for building it or creating the right environment for it to flourish. Yeah, definitely. There's a there's a few. So let's start with curiosity, because I think curiosity is a driver for creativity and creativity is the precursor to innovation. So you, you kind of need what one jumps to the next, jumps to the next. And if you think of curiosity as the open mind, creativity is the the thinking and then innovation is the doing is how I kind of like to, to, to describe those those three. Um, so expanding your field of vision as much as you can, you know, looking outside your industry, if, you, if we're talking in a work context, looking at different stuff, not just looking at what's been done before and repeating it, but applying critical thinking and questioning stuff um, can definitely all, all help you uh, become more creative. But yeah, there's some very specific tips that we talk about actually in the series that they think are helpful. The, my first or the first is actually well-being. So looking after yourself because stress kills creativity. We all know when we're super, super stressed, um, we don't get 
it, that we don't get our best work done you know and we certainly don't come up with any outside the box ideas when we're super stressed we're just blinkered and doing the thing that we need so that that kind of that stress does does not help creativity at all and i think you know i find my some of my best ideas come when i have some mental downtime so uh maybe i'm on holiday not that i get any downtime on, on holiday at the moment because i've got three kids but three young kids um but you know in this kind of hypothetical world where i was able to sit on a sun lounge and read a book um that would in the past that has definitely sort of triggered some of some great ideas because you're, you're just not thinking about stuff and stuff comes to you and we've all been there and you know it, that, that that sort of creativity can can flourish when the mind is allowed to 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 relax and there's i won't go into it but there's 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 some chemicals that there's a reason that happens liggy explains it really well in our uh in, in the series actually yeah um i won't try to um and then an, another one is actually just practicing creativity. So do new things, flex mm. those muscles. And, you know, it doesn't have, I'm not talking about sitting down and brainstorming constantly, but just do creative things, whether that's inside or outside of work. Um, and uh, the other thing is I would say actually like time box or allow time for it. So instead of just hoping creativity will hit you at some point, be intentional about it and, and say, right, I'm going to go and I'm going to think about this problem at this time. I'm going to go for a walk and, or I'm going to write stuff out, whatever it is, um, and actually, you know, spend time flexing and deploying and practicing those things. Um, surround yourself with the right people. Um, and actually, this fits in really well with, I, I think, probably my most important point around creativity, and that's on that psychological safety. Um, yeah. So... You know, you need to create the right environment for creativity to flourish. And that's if you're a, an individual or a manager or whatever, you need an environment where it is safe to fail. Otherwise, no one will try anything new. Mm. Um, you know, we've all, we've all been there. We've all been in those more toxic work environments or worked with people where actually I'm not going to say what I really think here because I'm just going to be shouted down or so they're going to say something sarcastic or whatever. And I, I just I'm not going to do it. And and that you know that lack of psychological safety that fear of failure kills creativity um yeah. so i think one of the best things you can do especially as a leader to to kind of encourage and cultivate creativity is create a psychologically safe place yeah. um one one thing that i loved and this was from this was actually from talking to a client uh, or a client or a prospect last year they said they um quarterly they had a they had a thing in their quarterly meetings where they celebrated failure so mm. whoever had tried something new but it had gone wrong they talked about it they talked about the lessons that they'd learned um and you know what they were going to do differently next time but as a team they celebrated and elevated that failure uh as a as a way to as a way to show that you know this is what we want we want people pushing boundaries and pushing the edges of what's possible not just playing it safe all the time um and so yeah i think um i think that's yeah that's that's super important i quite i quite like that that mm. story as well yeah no 100 percent. i think it's about being intentional about creativity like you said to that point of time blocking and um, giving yourself the right environment but especially as a manager i think sometimes it's easy to just fall into the same old perceived views of creativity so let's all get on a call and brainstorm but what if four people in your team actually hate brainstorming that way and the best thing for you to be doing is putting speed dating style thing where just for five minutes you and them talk because otherwise they might not feel comfortable in the environment bringing that to the table you know um i can think of companies i've been in where someone who brings up a new idea just gets shot down right away so they don't even get the chance to fail they just get no, no, we don't do it that way because X, Y, and Z, rather than being heard out for their, their ideas. So I think it's being intentional about, like, do you have ground rules for a meeting where if someone brings up an idea, you're not allowed to interrupt until they've finished explaining what it is? Or are you actually asking people what would be a good environment to brainstorm? Is that together or is it, is it um, alone? And I think that actually we're going to move on to some topics that discuss vulnerability, but that is one of the things if you want people to learn and to truly be open to being creative, they have to be vulnerable to an extent. And if your culture isn't there for them to do it, it's the first hurdle that will stop that, that breaking down. Yeah. Big time. And as a, you know, as a manager or a leader, the best thing you can do in so many situations is, mm -hmm. is share where you've messed up, yeah. you know, because people, a people appreciate it. B, um, you know, they want to know that you're human. Um, and, see it it opens the it opens the way for for them to have the same 
open and honest dialogue as um as, as you're having so yeah. yeah lead you know lead by example is the is a is a, is a good one for, i mean that that lead by example basically applies to every single one of yeah. these yeah exactly <laughs> your skills yeah. but yeah I, I think you're right in particular vulnerability because i think that you know the more you can the, you know if you can if you can show that in a in a correct and measured way as a as, as a leader then um others will um others will, will it will help create that psychologically safe environment that we talk yeah. about yeah and the other thing i really like that you explained in that is to leverage things from outside your perceived space that you work in and one thing i do that really helps me with this is i just bank ideas as i go so screenshots of things i see on instagram and i drop them in a folder on my phone same with linkedin um if I see like maybe a YouTube channel or a podcast does something interesting and I think that's different, that's a creative way to a, a problem, I'll take note of that. So there's a few YouTube channels I like that just have people who drop in for 10, 15 minutes to discuss a particular topic and, um, you know, reflecting something I've been quite guilty of is always maybe veering towards, let's just have a panel of three people talking to each other about a topic, but something I'm going to try is having four people drop in for 15 minutes about one particular topic and that's leveraged from a football youtube channel as opposed to anything inside my space yeah. um so i really like that idea and i've got the post-it note and a pen next to my bed to that point because like you i don't always do my best thinking um at work i do my best thinking at night and if i realize if i don't write something down then i will it's gone forever that that time of night just before it's a little bit frustrating because it's normally yeah. just before you're going to sleep but that's when you that's when your brain basically files and organizes everything from the day and you start yeah. to dip into that kind of REM sleep where your dreams start and all that kind of stuff but that some of <laughs> some some of the the thoughts creativity ideas that is generated in that time is is often you know there's a lot of rubbish in there don't get me wrong yeah. but there's, yeah. there's there's often some absolute yeah. gems as well so yeah i would i would i would definitely i i use my phone i probably shouldn't because of you know keeping you awake at night a pen yeah. and paper yeah. is probably better but but yeah i'm constantly dropping notes into my phone at yeah. that time of night for exactly that reason <sighs> brain straight back to being awake uh, to be fair i have to put a lamp on in my room to um to write the stuff down because <laughs> i did try <laughs> i did try just in the dark try and write it down and hope that it was legible in the morning but I, yeah impossible task if i find a glow in the dark pen oh, gary I'll, yes. uh, i'm gonna get you on for yes, christmas there you go Perfect. <laughs> um some some of the stuff we spoke about there about challenging norms or thinking about preconceived ideas leads us nicely on to the next one we're going to discuss which is critical thinking and the importance as a future human for not taking things at face value and applying scrutiny to stuff to get that full story and the full context. And often I think that that is a skill for everyone, but I can really see how that helps L and D in the future as well, because, you know, we'll see lots of people shouting about this new shiny tool that they've used, but there's more to it. You know, there'll be lots of people who, for every one person who shouted about it, there might be three or four people who failed, or, you know, if we need to really find a blocker or a problem or, um, find a new solution we have to think critically about everything that's going on so yeah tell me a bit more about cr critical thinking as a skill for the future and you know how we can build that yeah i mean just specifically with with L D as well i think there's a there's a, there's like an overwhelming um array of technology way of doing things uh theories uh and all sorts of stuff that makes it makes it i think in any industry but i, I definitely feel it in in sort of learning in particular there there is an overwhelming amount of um amount of things out, out there and it's very easy to be distracted like you say by the next shiny thing that um that comes along and actually this this came up again and again in um a load of the interviews that I did recently for the learning and Ch learning and development challenges podcast that we run so not to not to plug our own podcast but <laughs> it is for L&D professionals yeah. and actually one of the themes is you know what what do you do around technology and um and buying and, and a lot of the time it is the advice that you know L D pros have, have given is see what you can do with you know what you've already what you've already got um and only make a decision when you've done a good deep critical assessment of whether that tool fits in with what you're going to need for the future and i think yeah. you know you can you know, I'm not. I'm not saying you have to think critically about every decision 
in in life you know what you know you can you can maybe be frivolous with you know what you're having for lunch or something but in terms of in terms of the these bigger decisions or decisions that might have a long-term impact on the organization or involve multiple people then you know definitely um you know be, be very ruthless about what is important and what isn't yeah. um and i think actually a real a real kind of nice way of thinking about that is just being super clear on your on your your goals or yeah. your vision so where you, what are you trying to achieve with, the, with this what are you doing and then in the case of i don't know say picking a learning and development tool feels like a good topic given you know given <laughs> given yeah. where we both are um you know it do, does it does it do the things that i need it to do is this the thing to carry me through and and just be yeah i think be i think you've got, you've got to be a little bit um ruthless about the decision making sometimes but but super clear on where you want to where you want to to get to um and you know run a run a litmus test against things as well so you know when you're excited by something new run it against the the goal or the vision yeah. does it align with what i'm trying to do here or actually is that taking me off over here and i'm just trying to get straight up here you know yeah. that's that's i think a really important one um yeah. go deeper ask a lot of questions challenge the status quo challenge assumptions um all those things for critical thinking and i think also one of the things we talked about i think in the in the series was you know break larger problems into into smaller chunks yeah. and try and get to the the root of the issue as well so surface level um might not give you enough of a kind of answer as to why something is the way it is so go uh, go a bit deeper and look at the yeah. try and understand the try and understand the why um but yeah it's 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 difficult i think i think overall my view on critical thinking is is you know maybe apply more scrutiny than you naturally would yeah. to decisions and um and ask more questions and again let's link this back to curiosity cuz 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 we can be more curious you know yeah. um look ask more questions and uh, go a bit deeper all that kind of stuff yeah no, I think it, I completely agree with all of that. I think one thing I've tried to do is just always ask myself two questions. Why are we doing this? And what is the, the goal or outcome? Um, I think when we, I imagine L&D is the same as marketing in this way, but when you have a lot of things you do in a repeated way or they keep recurring, it's so easy to just start doing it before you ask yourself, actually, is this the best way to do it? And um, before you know it, you're on a hamster wheel and you can't get off it. So I've always just tried to ask myself those two questions for a couple of years and the, the real crystallizing point actually is I spent about a year trying to build a newsletter. Um, and what I would do is over a week, I would consolidate the best things I read and try and share that on LinkedIn with the idea that I could drive people to sign up for a form and therefore build this list. And actually what I realized was I was creating a lot of good content, but no one was really signing up to the newsletter at the, the rate I would expect them to or with the target in mind so the newsletter isn't the good mechanism i can still do the thing of collating all of the good resources i find and then start sharing them and maybe the shift is then if the idea is to build awareness or build an audience then just share that without the newsletter part on on linkedin and um probably weren't critical enough early enough to have saved myself a lot of time because i think i did it for probably three or four months longer than than i needed to because i was in the habit as opposed to I could have realized at an earlier point, actually, this isn't the best way to reach the goal and um, you should distribute the content in a different way. So I really find that it's about being critical of yourself as well. I think sometimes we think externally about critical thinking, but it's as much about asking yourself internally, why do I do this thing? What am I actually trying to achieve? Um, is this actually the best way to do it? Is this a good use of my time? You know, yeah. that's a that's a great one, especially yeah. if you're you know thinking time management and all that kind of stuff. It's like, um, you know, d is this is, is this something that I should be doing? Is it something I should delegate? Is it something I should just not do altogether? All that kind of stuff. I think definitely definitely think about that. Um, and then yeah, there's a great quote from Jeff Bezos, which is, uh, "We are." Oh, I have to try and remember this now. Um, no, I've forgotten it. <laughs> What, what's the what's the paraphrased version? Yeah, because I'm set. terrible with this as well. I always forget. Uh, I have it somewhere on my I have it somewhere on my uh, on my computer. I, yeah. I can grab it. Yeah, we are. Hold up. No, I don't have it. Sorry, sorry, Gary. I've to edit this <laughs> okay. out. Oh no, we're stubborn on vision. We're flexible on details. That's the mm. one. That is yeah. the one. Stubborn on vision, flexible on details, and yeah. I I, lo I love that because that 
you know, for me, that crosses over into critical thinking, that crosses yeah. over into time management, what you do with your time as well. And yeah, just um, be be clear on where you're going, but how you get there is um, up for grabs. Yeah, 100%. I mean, <clears throat> I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in the plan run, running order, but that leads us nicely to collaboration because I think a lot of L&D teams want to drive impact, they want to reach an outcome, but often... We need to be flexible about the way we get there because the journey shouldn't be at the expense of the outcome. So if we say that we want to achieve, I don't know, an arbitrary thing is 100 people to complete a course. But the way we get people to do it is by constantly bombarding them and nudging them to the point where they don't view us positively or kind of like strong arming people into doing it. No one's going to enjoy the journey, even though we got to the outcome. So I think to that point, being flexible about the details and stubborn about the vision is that idea of collaborate with people in a way that's fruitful especially in an environment where things are going to change fast so yeah tell us a little bit about collaboration as that human skill for the future yeah well it's it's you know i think it's essential it's there's, there's so many reasons to collaborate you know a problem shared is a problem halved all this, like, all this kind of sayings that everyone's heard but um you know i think i think good in order to collaborate you you need to be in, it, empathy drives collaboration in my eyes so you if you're empathetic if you understand where people are coming from um if you can put yourself in the shoes of others then um then then you'll be able to, to to kind of collaborate effectively and i think in order to work well in a team and this is you know from personal experience but also from stuff we've read and researched it's just you know giving people the proper respect like you say um and time and actually time's a really important one and one that people miss a lot of the time. So you can have respect for the opinions of others, but if you're talking over them and not giving them the time yeah. to to speak, then then you know, you I guess you're not you're not kind of actually giving them the right level of of, of respect. So we've all had a you know, a meeting with a dominant character that, that their agenda gets that gets kind of pushed through. Um and I um there was actually a there's a, a book I read last year um called time to think by nancy klein um and something you kind of touched on earlier actually gary um they they run something called a thinking environment which is basically where everyone has a set amount of time to speak mm. in a meeting or not speak they can just sit there in silence and think if they like and it's yeah. actually it's really interesting but the that kind of respect for each other respect for each mm. other's time and allowing people that space to um to think or to talk you know whatever works for them some people will if you have 10 minutes will think for nine minutes and will say something really interesting for one yeah. others will yeah. talk for the full 10 minutes but that's their process because they're yeah. sounding out their their thoughts you know and that's that's how they work so um but yeah i thought the the thinking environment if you've if you've not looked at that i, I mm. definitely have a look at that as a way for um kind of enc encouraging uh collaboration um but then, yeah, just there's just loads of other basics, you know, raise people up, don't put them down. Um, yeah. You know, how do you how do you get the best out of people? Um, uh, yeah, a empathy, empathy, definitely. Um, but um, but yeah, just just being being that person, being there for them, all the rest yeah. of it um, definitely <clears throat> helps. 100%. And we've kind of rolled the last two we're going to talk about together because I'll flag to people that there is empathy is one of the skills and there's dedicated resources in that in the series. But it's really funny you say about that culture of speaking in meetings because um, regular listeners will know that I go to Toastmasters. I've been doing it for about a year and a half and we have a lot of people come as guests or members for short times. And one of the things I noticed is that they know their stuff. But at work, they just don't have the way to communicate particularly well in meetings or they don't feel confident enough. And what happens is the people who are confident in speaking are the ones who speak the most and therefore their, eyes, their ideas get heard the most. And um, so I think actually collaboration is also about recognising where other people might be less comfortable. So, for example, I am one of those people that if no one speaks in a meeting, I've got no problem speaking for ages. But actually, maybe collaboration in an ideal world is better if I just shut up for five minutes. And even if we sit there in awkward silence, it will give other people the space to, to start speaking and start sharing their ideas. So um, I, you're, you're right on all of these being linked because the, some of the self-awareness, some of the empathy stuff comes in it there because you have to think critically and say, what are the skills I have actually that others might not have and therefore I'm dominating a conversation or what, what do I admire about other people um, as well? 
yeah it's a bit of an extrovert introvert thing as well in a lot of cases and it's some people are just you know you, you and i sound like we're similar gary if there's an empty space i'll try and i'll try and fill it and i yeah. could have maybe been a radio dj in a, yeah. in a different life um but yeah the, I, I i completely agree with that and it, it's so important and actually what if we're to loop back to empathy because that's one of the ones that we did um we're gonna we're gonna talk about a empathy i think is up there with resilience in terms of if i was ranking the the top 10 yeah, the, the the 10 of these skills i put empathy resilience towards the top for sure um but i think one of the ways to achieve empathy is that active listening which again is super helpful in in collaboration also and that that sometimes is just being quiet and letting the person speak but other times if it is uh if it is someone who is developing an idea it's asking deeper questions yeah. so it's understanding what they're saying and asking pertinent questions to draw more out of that person yeah. rather than just coming in with your opinion or waiting you know wait, waiting patiently for you to put your viewpoint ahead so yeah. i think i think that's an important one that, that whole active listening piece and i think that's um that's a skill that is you know underrated in, yeah. in a lot of the cases it's, it's amazing for collaboration it's it's essential in sales it's you know just that kind of understanding and getting to the root cause of, yeah. of, of where people are coming from is, um, yeah, is, is, a, is an amazing, is an amazing power. It's a super mm. skill, if you like. Yeah. No, and it, it, I think in the webinar, Liggy explained it as, you know, you need to hold space for people without judgment, because if you really like anything that involves some sort of relationship with someone or needing to diagnose a problem for people, they will need to be vulnerable with you to some extent. And if it yeah. feels like you're judging them or you don't approach the conversation in the right way, then, um, yeah, you are setting yourself up for failure. One of the best things I learned recently on the podcast is I had um, Dr. Keith Keaton on who wrote the book about being a trusted learning advisor. And he said, if you want to get, have successful conversations where you diagnose problems, practice them. Because otherwise, how are you prepared for objections you might face or how are you prepared for all the different ways a conversation could go and i think that is one of the best ways to build empathy and collaboration is to practice the scenario ahead of time so that you know how you react if certain things happen or you know you feel more comfortable with the subject matter so you can be quieter in those periods where saying something would be detrimental as opposed to beneficial yeah big time it, it sort of comes back to being aware of your own bias being conscious of that bias as well because you know you're i think let like you say forcing your view opinion on the situation when that is not the view or opinion of, of what's coming the other way is uh it's actually quite difficult it's quite difficult not to do because especially if you're passionate about the topic or the subject you know mm. you get talking like oh yeah but what about this and i think this and you know away you go um so being a if you're someone that if you're someone that does do that being aware of it being able to step back being conscious of it um just being conscious of any of those underlying mm. views that you might hold that actually you know they're, they're your truths they're not necessarily yeah. other people's truths yeah. and um and yeah and, and being able to react accordingly again makes you a more empathetic person and yeah. really helps that collaborative process yeah yeah, exactly. It comes back to that point you mentioned earlier, like you don't necessarily need to agree with someone. But if you go into the conversation thinking you need to share your insights, then you're going to end up disagreeing with people. If you go in with the mindset, that actually, I just need to discover about this person and I don't need to challenge the things I disagree with um, would be my, my take on it. Um, I wanted to end with another question about skills because we started off talking about the um, World Economic Forum skills report. Obviously, people are particularly worried about how they protect their skills, how we solve a skill shortage over the long term. But actually, I think collaboration is one of those sort of unseen superpowers for solving the skills problem. Because let's say that you don't have the skill and it would take you a long time to build it, but someone else in your team might already have that skill or between you, you can come up with the skill needed to get something over the line. So I think knowing who has what skills internally, collaborating together on projects where you can fill in your gaps is actually a quicker way than saying, do I need to build this skill? Do I have time to build this skill in time to solve the problem that needs solving? So just any thoughts on yeah, collaboration as a way to maybe fill some of the skills gaps as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you need to, you, you know, obviously each person, if they are bringing that skill to a table needs to have developed it somewhere. So there's definitely an underlying, an underlying need, but you're spot on. I think collaboration can accelerate a problem solving or troubleshooting process. Um, 
and you can you can normally get to an answer or a, a better answer a more creative answer say um wh when you when you're bringing other people in on that um on that process and also you get to you get to stress test your own ideas you get to bounce those off other people as well yeah. and if you've created this psychologically safe environment where people can you know say what they think and there's there's no there's no like kind of you know failure is celebrating all that kind yeah. of stuff then yeah. then you're in a, a really good place to a maybe come up with something that's a little more outside the box than you might conventionally do um but b get there a lot get there a lot quicker so i think all these things all these different skills if you like and you, you picked five brilliant ones by the way gary to talk about i think all 10 are great but you really, yeah. you really picked on five super ones um all of these interweave interlock and um contribute to developing the development of um of of uh of skills and, and helping yeah. us kind of solve solve the challenges and the issues mm -hmm. that, are, that are coming at us in the future so yeah. yeah and that's a big that's a big reason why we focused on behavioral skills in particular but and also picked picked the 10 that we did pick for this series yeah yeah and to fill people in i'm going to put the link in the description but some of the ones we didn't cover were things like time management flexibility um yeah, what else am i missing uh innovation initiative. so yeah initiative there's a lot of great ones in there um and i didn't mention the format at the start as well but they're 30 minute audio lessons aren't they um so yeah. people can kind of consume them on the go and there's um you know other resources alongside those to, to help test people but i think that leads us nicely into just quickly ending with a bit about assemble you and what you do and the the content you create as well adam yeah sure well so the the future human series slightly different audio to to what we normally create the future human we liggy and i look at the um we actually looked at like four or five things for each of these skills so what is it why is it important what are the barriers to learning this skill how do we develop it um we looked at lots of journal studies various other things drew on uh experiences from from within industry and our own working careers as well to um to create it um and like I say, we combined that with downloadable resources, tests, there's a few other bits in there that turn it into a bit more of a learning object. But the idea is you can listen to them on the go. And that's the whole the whole kind of modus operandi of Assemble You is bringing consumer grade learning experiences into into the corporate learning environment. So our um, our first product is, uh, is, you know, audio lessons. So succinct 10 minute podcasts that you listen to on the go um we cover some behavioral skills but um uh, a much like broader range of soft skills so communication productivity mm. uh mental health and well-being um even into things like sustainability dei all that kind of stuff as well and um and so yeah we have a uh, a library of those available on uh, available on how now actually on how through how now plus so worth mentioning that um as is the as is the the new um future human series but yeah so we're, we think of us as um audio learning experts and we're, we're trying to bring those kind of best consumer practices of uh of learning into into the kind of corporate learning and development space yeah awesome brilliant adam thank you so much for for chatting to me today i've really enjoyed this conversation uh, something a little bit different as well so hopefully uh, our audience enjoyed it as well Yes, yeah, we tried to touch on learning and development as much as possible, but I just these these skills just underpin so many different one. areas of areas of life and work that um yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully you found it useful. So yeah, thanks for listening. Cool. 100%. Thanks a lot, Adam.